couple people are trailing in. Um, I have, uh, hello everybody, hi. I have two, uh, <clears throat> I have two announcements. Uh, I'm gonna get started. So I wanna make sure we have an on-time start uh, because I have a lot to cover. And I was, as we may have recall, I was a little behind on, on Monday. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn this off. And my two announcements are pretty minor. Um, one is a, a shout out, thank you to the student who alerted me to the fact that I posted the wrong recording. Uh, fix that, it should be fixed. Um, happens, cut and paste, you know, it's a little problematic. Um, other thing that I wanted to announce, um, and you can find this on the Canvas website, and that is um, this morning I went ahead and posted to our um, hashtag. Um, and actually it looks like I didn't get a chance to post it to Canvas or maybe I posted it to the wrong semester. So I'll just show you on Instagram what that looks like. Um, so I created a hashtag for the class on Instagram. If you want to uh, share your work on Instagram, it's absolutely not required, um, but if you do wanna share it and you wanna see what other people are doing, um, that is one way to do it. So I had an account at one time, but yeah, keeping track of passwords is hard. So I think it's just easier to use a hashtag. Um, so uh, if you all want to do that, that's great. If you don't, uh, it's not great. It it's not, doesn't have anything to do with your grade. It's just a way that you, know, you can share your images with other people if you want to. Anybody have any questions about that? OK. Um, in terms of platforms, like I'm definitely under the impression that Instagram is like declining in popularity. <coughs> if you all have any, uh, do y'all have Instagram accounts? Most people, some, yeah, most people. Um, if, there's, if there's another platform that you would like to suggest, like feel free to suggest it. Um, I mean, I have been talking for a while about maintaining a Discord page. Um, we just haven't done it. Um, but yeah, if there are other things that you, you know, other platforms or whatever, um, if you don't wanna like, you know, have the taint of the boomer or whatever, um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, just let me know. Um, any other sort of questions or comments about that? All right. Welcome. So, um, great. Well, I'll go ahead and get started with our regularly scheduled history lecture. Um, so, as promised, I'm going to finish up uh, the sort of uh, last chunk of slides from last class, and then we'll move on to the uh, what we're doing today. So I did make a really big deal about the sort of existential crisis that painting was going through uh, during the sort of like turn of the century, World War I era. Um, and yeah, basically it kind of catalyzed abstract art. Um, now, at the same time there was a lot of abstract art being made, there was also a lot of work that in the field of maybe design or some people would call this applied art, um, Another term for it is actually uh, propaganda, is what happens when art is applied to a political movement. Um, and that's really like the sort of early part of the 20th century is when we start to see art being kind of um, leveraged for political movements. Um, in this case, the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, in other cases, uh, actually uh, into the later half of the 20th century, um, uh, China is one of the biggest sort of producers of uh, art uh, during the Maoist era of art that sort of, you know, speaks to the values of the ruling party at the time and really tries to get those values out to people via images, right? So it's very much like the use of art as propaganda. Um, I think it's continuing into today, but it very much is a 20th century phenomenon. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the other thing that is happening in the 20th century is that design is sort of starting to come into its own as something to be appreciated. People aren't calling it art, um, but people are putting it in art museums and sort of making the gesture like, oh, we should really look at this. This actually has a quality all on its own, and maybe it's equal to art in some way. Um, so the, that starts to really kind of get going in the post-World War I era and into the World War II era, this idea of design as you know, something that's sort of worth looking at. Um, the big thing at the end of this uh, slide talk it has to do with the so-called birth of the computer. Um, and so I have three slides about that that we can talk about. Um, one of the reasons why I'm kind of circling back and making sure that I cover this is because it's going to be on the exam. Um, so, a couple of things. Um, code breaking. Um, so, during World War II, there was this technology that allowed people to communicate with other people, and that was called the telephone. Um, we still have wired telephones in our world. There's not too many of them, but it's really pretty much exactly the same thing as, you know, if you've ever seen a landline. Um, and what would happen is that those those phone calls, whether they were um, written in Morse code or some sort of, you know, um, dip, dip, da dash kind of thing, or whether they were actually spoken language, those phone calls were being intercepted. And uh, they were, you know, basically governments were sort of saying, oh, well, if people can intercept these phone calls, then obviously we need to encrypt them. Um, and so the idea of encrypting this information into an alphanumeric kind of format that people couldn't read was a, a huge deal. I mean, that was basically like the only way that you could be sure that your message was getting from point A to point B without the person whose submarine you're about to blow up like finding out about it. Um, and so these uh, encryption devices were actually pretty simple. Um, I mean, simple by our sort of contemporary terms. So the encryption is really some, like a, you make a, something like a metal die that works with a typewriter, and that die just converts one character to another, right? So now, in order to decrypt these, it was a lot, a lot harder, <laughs> a lot more computing power uh, required. So back here, you can see we have the two. There's an, um, a German-made uh, enigma. With, so um, the German uh, government basically sp spread out these tools and they would encrypt all their messages with this thing called the Enigma. Um, and then um, some British people in uh, a little place called Bletchley Park basically started coming up with the task of decrypting this stuff. Um, and this is a super interesting history. Like, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it today. There are a couple of links. Um, if you happen to be um, somebody who's interested in, like, diversity in computing and how maybe computing culture has diversified, uh, it's a super interesting history uh, because um, we all kind of probably know that 30 or 40 years ago, there weren't very many women in computing, right? I can personally attest to that. I was like the only woman in my classes <laughs> in college. Um, it's great um, if you have like a taste for beer and Dungeons and Dragons, but you know, it's maybe not so great for like society as a whole. Um, but what sort of happened what, uh, with this whole phenomenon is you can actually find out that early on, like in this time period, um, most of the people doing the actual work of computing were actually women. Um, and these were women that were pressed into service as part of the war effort. Um, and then when the war was won, uh, they basically were asked to go back home. Um, and so it's a really interesting story of sort of like how um, computing culture sort of became uh, for a little while, maybe not so much anymore, but for a certain period in our, uh, in American history at least, it became kind of a uh, exclusively male thing. Um, so yeah, there's a ton of sort of history behind this whole Bletchley Park phenomenon. There's actually a Netflix series about it. Um, I believe it's called Bletchley Park. Um, there is also, um, if you look at any of the documentaries about Alan Turing or any of the um, Benedict Cumberbatch movie about Alan Turing, um, I believe it was called The Imitation Game, also kind of about the same time period and the same sort of set of circumstances. 
Um, so I do try to like recommend, uh, you know, educational movies um, whenever they come across, and this is definitely a topic that has several. So great. Um, let's jump into sort of the second half, and what we're going to be talking about in this sort of second um, half of the slideshow is we're going to be talking about uh, how art basically became computer art. How you go from maybe m back in last class making an engraving with mechanical tools in a really precise way, how you get from that to I actually programmed a computer to program this machine to do this thing, right? And that's basically the birth of computer art. Um, so you guys, uh, y'all might think, oh, well, if, if the personal computer was invented in 1977, that probably means computer art got going in the 1980s, right? Wrong. <laughs> um, no, actually, computer art got started a lot, um, a lot earlier than that. So we, ha we did, and I, I showed a couple slides like this, that we did have this interest in mechanics in general in the sort of post-war era. Um, but the idea of actually taking a computer and making an image out of it didn't really kind of get going uh, until the 1960s. But also that was well before personal computers sort of you know, made everybody a digital artist, which probably happened in like the 80s and 90s. So, so this whole sort of like phase of early computer art that happens from like 1965 to like maybe 1980 or so um, is really a, a game played only by researchers and academics. Um, why? Well, um, if you remember back to that slide with that computer that you know looked like it filled a whole room, that's pretty much what computers were like. We could literally fill this room with a computer and it would be powerful enough to make um, some amazing image like this, where it's, and you're like, oh, it's just a few lines, Meg. Yeah, um, it was early, early days, <laughs> very early days. Um, and even this little image of, you know, uh, basically like some math, math equations visualized, um, even this image, when this sort of came out, it started coming out in like New York Times and major media outlets and people were like, oh, computers can make images. Like, um, it's not actually too different from the panic that we're getting about AI um, today. I, I have a people, a probably like at least every other day, because you know, I'm like an art professor, People have come up to me that I know, or people who know what I do, and they're like, hey, I heard your job's obsolete now, because AI is going to do it for you. Um, and I mean, sure, that's true. There's a new technology, and it has to be really powerful, and it can do things that humans can't do. Um, but I guess we can talk about this at length when we talk about AI. I am totally not afraid, um, because I th just sort of feel like there are, it just creates a different space for us to function in, right? Um, so it changes the game a little bit, maybe, but it doesn't, I don't think, make artists obsolete. So anyway, this sort of early, um, early computer art, almost all of it is linear in design, and this doesn't, but you'll see other images that really, we can, the, the grid really dominated, and there's a reason for that. Um, there is a link here of how uh, a pen plotter works. If nobody's ever seen a pen plotter, it's very, very similar to a 3D printer. You know how the 3D printer goes down and then it kind of like makes a two-dimensional pass? A pen plotter is basically exactly the same thing. It just doesn't have the, the up-down axis. Um, so most early computer art is done on what are called pen plotters. Um, and this is another sort of uh, early computer art work um, from 1965. And I think one of the... Um, really interesting things about this work is that this work is actually an imitation of a real painting by an artist um, named Paul Clay. And so you may be asking yourself, why is some academic computer science researcher trying to imitate a painting? Um, I will give you an answer for that. Um, he's trying to imitate a painting because he wants to legitimize his activity as art. So he's trying to link it to other artworks. Um, when computer art first came out, um, did people maybe take it seriously? Did people respect it? Did people even like it? 
not not unless you're an engineer. Like <laughs> people really hated it actually, and they thought that it was like threatening, you know, the existence of human-made artwork. Um, yeah, so, so a lot of early computer art references art history. Like you'll see images that are exactly like art history images. Um, and the reason for that is really just because people wanted to make the point that they were actually making art. So we also have like design um, and design graphics coming out at the same time. Um, and those are sort of, um, again, like in this gray area of is it art, it's, it's an image, it's maybe an image that's meant to educate, but is it really art? Um, and a lot of people around the time, uh, especially during this like 60s and 70s period, were asking those questions like, why is this even a thing? Why do we care? Um, so just to kind of illustrate why computer art was so limited early on, um, we'll take some time in this class to sort of talk about the development of the personal computer. One of the reasons they called it a personal computer is that this is literally an impersonal computer. Um, meaning, first of all, it takes up a whole room. Uh, second of all, you can't take it anywhere. It doesn't belong to you like it belongs to an institution and you rent out time on it. Um, so, so the use of a computer at this time was just so limited that people didn't really have access to you know, a computer in their house or in their artist studio. Um, so a lot of the early computer art is actually you know, research projects. Um, done by academics that then have to sort of like live this other life as art. Um, in early computer art, you start to see a lot of grid-based compositions and that possibly is on the final exam. Um, why do artists work with grids in early computer art? Um, that's sort of like asking why Bob Ross paints trees. Um, it's because like they're easy and that's just kind of what, what you do. Um, there was an interest in philosophy at the time that was called systems theory. And I think that a lot of early computer artists were influenced by some of those ideas regarding systems theory where they didn't want to just make a picture of something. They wanted to actually create a system and then mess with it and then see what happens. So the grid just happened to be a really good way of making a system. Also, you know, speaking kind of from the standpoint of a coder, um, it's really easy to code a grid. <laughs> so um, I think some of it was convenience and some of it was maybe some genuine uh, interest in sort of seeing what happens when maybe you repeat something and then you don't repeat it in other ways, right? So there's a system of kind of regimented repetition, but then it gets warped, it gets interrupted, and people were very interested in those types of ideas. Um, so you see just tons and tons of grids in early computer art. Um, the other reason people use grids in computer art is because there was a gesture towards pixels. Um, you may, th maybe a lot of people think that pixels are like the most basic form of digital art. Um, and I guess that's, I could argue that that's probably true in, certainly in today's usage, but pixels were actually invented pretty well after uh, people made, started making images with lines and shapes and things like that. Um, and the reason is because it takes more computing power to process pixels. Um, but that idea of the grid and the pixel grid is definitely something that's just like super foundational to computer art and also to early computer printing. Um, this is actually an, another example of uh, artwork that's extremely close to, this is very, very close to a, a really famous painting by Manet called Olympia. Um, and it's just another example of using sort of like tropes in painting to legitimize computer art. Um, here's another sort of early pixel-based image. Um, and you can see in both of these pixel-based images, they're not really pixels, they're actually text characters. 
Um, so if you look at it on your own screen, you can probably uh, zoom. Um, but this idea of making uh, grids of ASCII characters, ASCII is pretty much like any, that's our, our, the character set that we work with today. Um, most people probably don't know what it's called, but that's, that's what it is. So any, any sort of like special character, number, letter on your computer is an ASCII character. Um, and a lot of this ASCII art is very much like rooted in this time period. But um, if you're the type of person that's kind of out on the internet on certain message boards or, you know, whatever uh, sort of social media, um, a lot of platforms still allow you to use ASCII art um, at the top of your message or something. And it's super retro, but it's super fun. If you just Google ASCII art, there are so many like converters out there where you can upload your photos or you know, upload a design that you made and have it converted. Um, and then you can cut and paste it um, you know, and turn it in uh, with your paper if you really wanted to. But that history goes back uh, actually quite far. Um, you can see this is about 68. Late 60s is when we started to get pixels. And so now we're sort of like gonna be getting into like a history that is probably a little more familiar to you um, and that is uh, this sort of pop, I, I'm gonna be very academically very careful and I'm gonna say that we're talking about the popularization of the personal computer, not the invention of the personal computer. Um, you'll see in um, a video that we watch later in the semester that Apple, 100% absolutely did not invent the personal computer. Um, they popularized it and you know put it out to market, um, but they didn't actually invent it. So um, yeah, but that being said, in the late 70s, several manufacturers were sort of releasing devices that were like personal computers. And as I said before, like what made it a personal computer? Well, um, you could actually own one for starters. Um, they were cheap enough. Some of them were anywhere between like $5,000 to $20,000. So still something that is only for really brave, you know, people with a lot of dispensable income, certainly, but accessible to people who are not maybe billionaires. Um, and so, Pretty quickly after those computers came out, the price came way, way down. Um, I would say within five years. And so this sort of led to a culture where people are uh, actively sort of making s images and uh, playing games. And I'm trying to think of what you could do with an early computer because it wasn't a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, you. You could definitely play games. You could talk to people via a text, uh, you know, text uh, exchange type message thing. Um, you could do word processing and finances, um, but they were still pretty limited. You didn't have like a really uh, like a high resolution pixel screen. Um, you may probably at that time you only had like four colors to use. Um, the pixel grid at that time when like the Apple personal computer, that pixel grid is only a couple hundred pixels by a couple hundred pixels. So um, yeah, it's, it, you know, it was a step, a step towards where we are now. Um, so in the 80s is really when people started to sort of get crazy with computers um, and uh, crazy in a good way. And um, the reason is just 100% because of access, um, that people could even, you know, s still obviously the most powerful computers were at sort of research institutions and in film studios and places like that. But theoretically, like you could go to a public library or you could, you know, potentially purchase one of these things yourself and start making um, imagery with it. So. There's this thing in computing called Moore's Law, um, and it's pretty, it's pretty accurate. Um, Moore's Law is a system by which they basically say that every, every generation of computers, um, the, I might be missing this just a tiny bit, with every generation of computers, the processing power goes up by an order of magnitude, so 10 times, basically. So 
within this generation of computers, you can see just probably from 1977 to like 1988 maybe, um, there's probably like 10 generations of computers. So the power of a computer goes up like 100 or 1,000 times more. Um, and so within the 80s, we really start to see the development of like digital graphics. Um, that really started to happen in the early 80s. And digital graphics started to get kind of picked up by the film industry. And th there is an old saying that it, in America, at least, the two things that pushed the computer industry are entertainment and pornography. Um, and those might be true, might, might not be true, I don't know. Um, but the point is that graphics and digital graphics are one of the most, at that time at least, one of the most demanding things you could do with your computer, right? So digital graphics, you can see digital graphics, like this is a really early example of digital graphics. How do we know it's early? Well, it has a really low pixel size. It doesn't have too many colors. It's not photorealistic. You know, there are all sorts of ways in which that um, technology just kind of drove itself. So we start to see people also start to combine digital images and digital technology with traditional, more traditional media. So for example, uh, digital photography kind of got going in the 1980s. Um, it didn't really get fully going until the 2000s. Um, because it kind of stayed in this sort of like not good enough to use professionally category for a really long time. Um, obviously now, it's hard for me to even think about, but I used to work at a pro photo lab when I was in college and there were these old dudes that were like, ha, ha, digital photography, it'll never happen. And, and I just remember like sort of keeping my mouth shut, but I was like, mm, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and yeah, of course, obviously, it happened very quickly. Um, the idea of digital photography and digital images is sort of something that it's probably one of the first sort of forms that you see in, uh, in digital graphics. The type of um, media that we're talking about here, which is like, Probably, um, this is a photographic print, but we can assume that this thing was probably rendered in so-called real time. Um, that type of like real time rendering and 3D graphics was a pretty far behind. Um, and the only reason is that it takes a lot less processing power to process a still image than it does uh, something moving or something that has a lot of polygons. Um, so there was also this really interesting phenomenon, like a social phenomenon in the 1980s. Um, I think if you kind of like just look for vaporwave on the internet and you'll understand. Um, it's this phenomenon of people like really fetishizing um, technology and thinking like, man, it's cool, like it's cool, it's new, it's, you know, all these things. Excuse me. Mm, sinuses. Um, and so this is just like a moment in, um, in television history that I find absolutely hilarious. So this was an actual um, person, this guy Max Hudrum, is an actual person who poses as a computer generated Android on a TV, on a TV show. And that's, that's the TV show. Like, and it's kind of like one of those things where you look back in history and you're just like, wow, that is the cra like one of the craziest things I've ever seen. Um, so I actually remember seeing this show when I was a very tiny child. And you know, when you're a child, you're like very um, impressionable and gullible. And I remember actually thinking that Max Hudrum was an android. Um, like I was 100% convinced. And then I found out like 20 years later that he was a real dude and it was just like, shattering. Um, but it's a really great example of how sort of the 80s, and this also kind of like floods into the 90s, the sort of enthusiasm around technology and computing culture was just like so thick you could feel it. Um, and I think that now, you know, having like lived almost a lifetime in in technology, 
I think now the conversation is very much about like, yeah, we have these tools, but how are we gonna use them ethically or how are we gonna use them responsibly? Um, and a lot of people ask me, maybe this is a good time to say this, a lot of people ask me like, why, if everybody knew that social media was kind of dangerous, like why did, why did people not do anything about it until like just now? Um, and here's my simple answer to you. Um, because politicians don't know anything about technology. Um, seriously. Um, I've been like participated in advocacy organizations like since the 90s and um, there are so many uh, legal issues that you know, are raised by technology and people just don't, don't understand why that's important. And probably now maybe people have a better idea of why that might be important. Um, so yeah, it, this idea of like enthusiasm towards technology is definitely something we'll probably hear about uh, again. Um, and then computer generated art, like still there's a certain kind of like minimalist aesthetic, right? that we can see that this image, even though it's from 1987, it bears a lot of similarities to some of the early computer art images that we looked at. And I would actually argue that um, this type of look, you will still see this in computer art today, where it's computer art that's made with kind of a minimalist sensibility. Um, and I think it's really just part of the field. Um, but it's certainly, It certainly sort of speaks to that sort of idea that no matter how sort of things develop or how things kind of shift, that there is there are some things about computer art that we can look at that are somewhat stable. Um, so there's also this uh, you know conversation about AI, um, and I, I always think it's a little bit hilarious because like. Uh, this conversation has literally been going on for like 30, 40 years. Um, so Harold Cohen is one of the first artists and researchers that started working with AI. And um, it's really fascinating to kind of look at some of the early AI because it does basically the same thing that AI image generators do today. It just does so in a much less stylistically, it's, you can't sort of dictate the stylistics of it like you can with AI image generators. It was like you had a, you have a very sort of, when you look at Harold Cohen's work, you have a very sort of clear idea that, okay, those are like, those are the rocks that I have to choose from, right? It's just less stuff, but the, but the basic premise is still completely the same. Um, and so, I feel an exam question coming along. Um, the 90s, pretty much the only thing I can say about the 90s is just more, better, lots more, lots better. But the th important thing about the 90s, and this is a really super important thing, is that the 90s is the decade in which the internet and the World Wide Web sort of came to people. Um, I don't wanna get into like, conversations about who invented the internet because, you know, lots of people did, um, is my answer. But um, basically, like, this idea of, you know, networks and using networks to sort of push your agenda, whether that's getting your art out there, uh, whether it's getting your sort of political message out there or whatever, all of that stuff really got going in the 90s. Um, and you start to see in the 90s, there was this brief moment um, in which the internet was free, as in speech. Um, is that the case now? I think actually like the way that social media platforms operate, like they kind of cap, they kind of take us back to a moment maybe before the 90s where we were dealing with commercial services, right? Um, and you had to sort of like navigate within this commercial platform. You couldn't go from like website to website to website. Um, and so there was kind of this like utopian vibe um, in the 90s. I'm sure you've heard about it before. Um, utopian in the sense of, I think there were people that thought that all information being 
all information being free would somehow lead to a kind of decentralization of authority and political authority in the world. Um, obviously, obviously that didn't happen. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but the sentiment was definitely there. Um, and, you know, I think that there were probably some decent things that came out of that time period, um, but it does sort of seem like the, the better intentions of people who kind of created early internet companies have sort of been knocked over in, in favor of shareholders' reports and, you know, making money. Um, one of the things in the 90s that starts to happen, and this is still really kind of something that people do today, is there's a whole genre of digital art in the 90s that I like to call people doing stuff on the internet. Um, and that is, in this case, it's a, here's a robot that you can interact with over a website. There was like a whole genre of these types of activities and performances, like um, controlling a paintball gun over a website, um, shooting a deer over a website. Um, you know, people did a lot of stuff related to cam girls. Um, if you don't know what that is, ask a friend. Um, yeah, there's just a whole sort of like um, uh, ex sort of field of people doing things, but doing them remotely or doing them in a way that is not sort of straightforward. Um, and that's kind of a 90s thing. It continues on today, but really sort of got going in the 90s. There's also like a really important moment in the 90s where computers became powerful enough to really do like large scale computer graphics. Um, so this image that I'm showing to you is by Mariko Mori, and uh, she's somebody who's like super interesting. She's from Tokyo, and she um, she really like explores um, her own sort of uh, identity through uh, almost like pop entertainment motifs. And um, what's notable about this, aside from the content, is the fact that this thing is Hugh freaking Mungus. It's like 12 feet by 20, almost 12 by 24 feet. Um, that's a lot of pixels. Um, and so there was this kind of moment in, in the 90s where people were like, yeah, I can make my, make my image gigantic and make it anything. Um, now that we sort of have like, you know, the cap capacity to make really large images, you see people doing it less and less. But at the time, I think it was considered novel. Um, so if we kind of move into like today, and by today I mean like the last 20 years, um, I'm going to continue to show you like for the most part all the talks that we do about people's art um, is going to be in the kind of contemporary space, like I consider like contemporary like within the last 10 years, um, although probably even closer to now just because that's the way technology works. Um, but within the last 20 years, there has been this sort of shift in technology in that um, you don't really know now when you look at art. There's no way of knowing if technology was involved. And I think that that's really like the defining characteristic of contemporary tech art. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, technology is sort of sophisticated to a level that you don't really have to like let the pixels show. Um, now, does that mean that all sort of contemporary digital art doesn't look digital? No, I mean, I in my own art, I actually like to have some of the artifacts of the digital. Um, and I like it to be obvious that it's computer generated. Um, but I would say broadly, like there's a, a real trend to using digital media in combination with other media. So this is actually a painting that I'm showing you. Um, and you're like, why are you showing me a painting? So I will tell you that I'm showing you a painting because this dude, Ben Edwards, um, actually makes vir virtual spaces. Um, at the time, I think he was using something like Unity. And he then actually hires people to paint paintings for him of his environments. Um, 
And that's sort of indicative of like a lot of artistic production today. I think that one of the most like maybe slightly crushing like insights that I had as an art student coming through school was the realization that a lot of art is like big box art, meaning that it takes like a fleet of 30 people to actually put the thing together, right? And so it's not very much like this one artist sort of just like laboring away. And people still do that. I mean, you know, uh, lots of people still work that way. But there is this sort of today in the contemporary art scene, there is this sort of like, um, almost like assumption that artists are not gonna be 100% making their own art. Um, and it's like on a certain level, I remember finding that like really disappointing. But then on another level, it's sort of like, like actually making some of that type of work now, like big public art and stuff like that. E there's just no way that somebody could physically do, you know, do the thing by themselves. Like, it's just not practical. So for me, it's like an issue of scale. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, that's kind of an interesting conversation that we'll probably have multiple times throughout the semester is this idea, like what is m making and how do you actually make stuff? Um, so again, digital media with other media, this says, um, it says it's acrylic on canvas. This is actually screen printed acrylic. Um, so the sort of, um, you know, printmaking and graphics um, is obviously very digital heavy. Um, Takashi Murakami is a really super interesting artist. Um, I love, I'm not like personally a huge fan of pop art, but um, his work is just incredible. And I think that, you know, a lot of his work is, uses like the hand because um, he works actually with tab a tablet and you know, draws those sort of cartoon shapes, but then he also uses these like, that sort of checker background, does that look familiar to anybody? Yeah, that's like this sort of quintessential Photoshop background. And so artists are also simultaneously like kind of emphasizing their connection to the digital. Um, and then there's also this sort of like moment in the 2000s, 2010s, where digital and your experience with the digital actually becomes history. So artists who were like my age were probably in their 30s in the 2000s, and they're like, oh man, I wanna make that Atari game that I used to play, or I wanna make that Nintendo game. Um, and so you start to see like the computing culture of the 70s, 80s uh, become sort of fodder at, for, as, as history for contemporary art. Um, and that's super fun. So Corey Archangel is a really, really well-known digital artist. Um, and um, and this is the work. Um, I don't know if anyone has had the exquisite pleasure of playing the original Super Mario Brothers on a, a, a Nintendo. Oh, yay. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's, it's like this whole like kind of 2D platformer game, right? So you just kind of, it just scrolls forever. And um, basically what Corey Archangel did uh, was he, he found a cartridge at a flea market and he pulled some, pulled some of the copper contacts out of it, plugged it back in and was like, cool, I just made an art. Um, and he, uh, he basically, you know, obviously made this as a video work, but also there was another element to this piece, and that was the instructions on how to do it yourself, um, which is probably one of the things that I think is coolest about this piece, that you can just go to any Nintendo game, you know, pull a couple of the contacts out, and you can have your own Super Mario clouds. Um, so there has, you know, Probably like around the 2000s, 2010s, we start to see this kind of like um, ethos of like, and I use this in huge air quotes, like hacking. Um, <laughs> and uh, I hate, I sort of hate everything that kind of goes along with that word, but um, yeah. Anyway, uh, it's, a, it's a really, really important piece. And I mean, you can also see that I think that this sort of speaks to Corey Archangel's sort of personality. Um, 
it's very, it's, it's pretty minimalist, right? Like, it's definitely a sort of minimalist gesture. Um, and if you look at some of Corey Archangel's other work, like, some of his work is even more minimalist than this. He did a series where he just made gradients in Photoshop, and then that was, that was the work. So it's like all pre-made or canned. Um, and it's definitely like a far cry from this, like, I'm, I'm an artist and I'm working really hard and laboring to make this thing that I'm really proud of. He, he's just kind of like, uh, just his affect when he talks even. If, if you like see an interview with him, he's just like, I'm like, whatever. You know, he's like one of those people. Um, and he doesn't really talk much. He doesn't really communicate. So, um, but people, just so you know, um, this, this piece, Super Mario Clouds, uh, I saw an essay once that called it the most important work of digital media art ever. Do I personally believe that? I don't know. I don't know about that. Um, and then, yeah, kind of getting into, you know, the contemporary, further and further into the contemporary. I mean, you start to also see the emergence in the last 20 years of artists who have a sort of full complement of computer science skills or artists that have a full complement of coding skills. Um, and so this is that, basically that type of work. This is an artist named uh, Mitchell Whitelaw who uh, basically took a picture, um, I think every minute of every day, and then composited them together by writing some code that pulls a pixel out of the image. Um, and so this idea of using code tools and using like data visualization tools is something that Again, like we sort of um, are still seeing it today. I mean, there are visualization tools everywhere, right? Like in software and apps that you download, um, in mass media. Um, but in terms of artists really working with this technology, it kind of got going in the 2000s. And they're still doing it. So here's some uh, other sort of um, code base work. And then I'm going to finish up with uh, these. And this is just from a, f a couple of years ago. Um, so a couple things. Um, after this, we're going to slide into kind of only contemporary stuff. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to kind of point out to you is that um, this is fully contemporary sort of code-based digital art. Um, and you may be somewhat, you know, tickled. I'm, t I'm somewhat tickled. By, uh, by the absolute similarities to er early computer art. Like, it's totally the same sensibility. Um, so a lot of these ideas, you know, just because they're in the past doesn't mean that they don't, like, still have a life today. Um, and I think that in some ways, like, the sort of contemporary, like, and by contemporary, I mean, like, right now, this sort of, like, lust for the um, 1980s and 90s culture um, I think that there are sort of like cycles that happen um, and cycles that people, social cycles. And so um, sort of like the more you zoom out, the more you start to see similarities, you know, in some of those broad strokes. So I'm going to take questions for just a sec. So in... Um, in class on Monday, we're going to get started with actually getting into some digital images. We're going to get into Photoshop, and we might also crack open a text editor. So I'll see you all on Monday.